Tak jaso ar taraitės įcelač vesel vaskulaitės. This disorder usually affects young Asian females, and the second name of this disorder is pulseless disease. So, let's explain why Takayasu vasculitis belongs to large vessel vasculitis and why it's important. I don't know. That's a good question. In our body, we have three types of vessels. It's large vessels as aorta and its branches. It's medium-sized vessels that supply blood to particular organs. For example, it's coronary arteries that supply blood to the heart or mesenteric arteries that supply blood to the intestine, or renal artery that supply blood to the kidneys, and its small vessels as arterials, capillaries, and venules. Takayasu arteritis affects large vessels, and its aorta and its branches. It's important because we have a group of disorders called vasculitis that can affect blood vessels, and the key feature here is that some types of vasculitis affect mostly large vessels. Some vasculitis affect medium-sized vessels, and other types of vasculitis affect small vessels. In addition to this, some vasculitis are associated with anka and some are not. It turns out that Takayasu arteritis affects only large vessels, and this vasculitis is not associated with anka. So, these two features help us in differential diagnosis. You know what I'm saying? It's an interesting point. Come on, let's get into character. To explain the logic of this disorder, we have to recall normal physiology. Here we have artery. The function of arteries is to provide the blood flow and we need to maintain normal blood flow to supply tissues with enough nutrients and oxygen for their function. In this case, let's take heart tissue, muscle tissue, joints, CNS and nervous tissue, kidneys and intestine. From physics, recall that blood flow is directly proportional to the pressure difference, which in this case is not so important and inversely proportional to the resistance of the vessel, and resistance is inversely proportional to the radius of the vessel. So, the most important concept here is that the larger is the radius of the vessel, the lower is the resistance, and the higher is the blood flow. This is the major principle how our cardiovascular system works. Pretty smart. Yeah, I got my moments. But sometimes, something can go wrong. So here we have large artery. On the bottom, we can see just the layer of endothelial cells, and on top we see three layers of arterial wool. It's intima, media, and adventitia. The function of arteries is to provide the blood flow. Recall that blood flow is equal to pressure difference divided on resistance, and resistance is inversely proportional to the force power of radius. Currently, we do not know the exact initial trigger of Takayasu arteritis, but according to some studies, infection as mycobacterium tuberculosis can initiate this disease. Is that a fact? No, no, it's not a fact, it's just what I heard. That's just what I heard. Who told you? They. So, mycobacteria triggers activation of our immune system. With the proper immune response, our immune cells destroy the bacteria. This results in release of bacterial debris. For example, it can be lipopolysaccharides that are normally contained inside the bacterial wall. Such lipopolysaccharides are bacterial antigens. And once they are released into the blood, macrophages that are contained in the arterial wall can phagocyte these small bacterial particles. After this, macrophages present these lipopolysaccharide particles on MHC2 receptors to T-helpers. 
The logic is that antigen presenting cells want to know. Is lipopolysaccharide normal material or it's something pathogenic? T helpers scan lipopolysaccharides and in normal condition T helper recognize them as bacterial antigens. But normally they do not trigger immune response. They just memorize information about this bacterial antigen. But in some people, T helpers can be overreactive to bacterial lipopolysaccharide. Fuck my hell, Tom. What's that? It's me belt, Turkish. No, Tommy, there's a gun in your trousers. What is a gun doing in your trousers? It's for protection. Protection from what? The Germans. The problem is that some individuals have MHC2 receptors that are produced based on HLA B52 allele. And such MHC2 receptors present lipopolysaccharide in an unusual way. In these circumstances, T helper exaggerates the danger. And in response to this bacterial debris, they begin a full immune response. Have I made myself clear, boys? Yeah, that's perfectly clear, Mickey, yeah. Just give me one minute to confer with my colleague. Did you understand a single word of what he just said? <laughs> so, in individuals with MHC2 receptors that are made based on HLA B52 allele, in response to bacterial lipopolysaccharide, T helpers become activated. Once T helper becomes activated, T helper induces activation of B lymphocytes. If B lymphocytes become activated, they begin to produce antibodies. In this case, B lymphocytes begin to produce antibodies against bacterial lipopolysaccharide. In Takayasu arteritis, there are no signature antibodies that we can use for diagnostic purposes. So let's call them just non-specific antibodies. But there is one big problem with these antibodies. In arterial wall, we have a lot of glycoproteins. And some of these glycoproteins can look very similar to bacterial lipopolysaccharide. This phenomenon we call molecular mimicry. And in this case, antibodies against bacterial lipopolysaccharide can mistakenly bind also to glycoproteins of arterial wall. And such autoantibodies against self-antigens can initiate severe inflammation within the adventitia. Also, with activation, T helpers induce activation of macrophages. With activation, macrophages begin to merge. Initially, they form giant cells and accumulation of giant cells results in formation of granuloma. In addition to this, activated T helpers induce activation of T killers. With activation, T killers begin to infiltrate the arterial wall. So, these three factors combined cause severe inflammation within the arterial wall, and the site of inflammation within the arterial wall becomes infiltrated by granulomas and T lymphocytes. Severe inflammation causes destruction within the arterial wall, and to keep the integrity of arterial wall in response to severe inflammation, fibroblasts begin to produce massive amount of collagen just to fill this empty space. With deposition of collagen, vessel becomes more narrow and stiff. So, local accumulation of collagen within the arterial wall causes stenosis. With stenosis, radius of artery decreases, with decrease in radius, resistance increases, and with increase in resistance, blood flow decreases. So, this results in decrease in blood income to tissues. So, the most common problem in Takayasu arteritis is stenosis of the large artery. But also, severe transmural inflammation with time can cause weakening of arterial wall, which will cause formation of aneurysm. There's something very wrong with this. So, at this point, we know that the signature feature of Takayasu arteritis 
is the presence of granulomas in the site of inflammation. And inflammation, with time, will cause deposition of collagen within the walls of the large artery, which will cause narrowing of aortic arch and proximal great vessels. So, Takayasu arteritis causes severe inflammation within the walls of the large artery. Inflammation, combined with massive deposition of collagen, causes significant narrowing of the blood vessel. The more narrow is the blood vessel, the smaller becomes the radius of the vessel. And with decrease in radius, resistance increase. With increase in resistance, blood flow decrease. And with decrease in blood flow, tissue blood supply decrease. Decrease in blood supply to heart tissue results in myocardial ischemia, which can manifest as angina or myocardial infarction. Nowadays, we have classification criteria for Takayasu arteritis. As we see, the first criteria is age younger than 60. The reason is that Takayasu arteritis is autoimmune disorder, and typically the highest risk of autoimmune reactions have young females. The second criteria is evidence of vasculitis on imaging, and as we see, female sex is also one of the criteria. The first clinical criteria is heart manifestations, as angina or ischemic cardiac pain. With decrease in blood supply to muscle tissue and joints, ischemia develops, and ischemia in this case manifests as myalgia and arthralgia. It can cause arm or leg claudation. In upper extremities, it can cause systolic blood pressure difference and weak pulse. These clinical symptoms are the signature features of Takayasu arteritis. So we have to understand the mechanism of these clinical symptoms in depth. Recall that when heart pushes blood into the aorta, blood in comes into the aortic arch. And initially, from aortic arch, blood is going into the brachiocephalic artery. And from brachiocephalic artery, blood is going into the right common carotid artery that supply blood to the brain, and right subclavian artery that supply blood to the right arm. From aortic arch, blood is also going to the left subclavian artery that supply blood to the left arm. How we can measure the amount of blood which incomes to the extremities? First of all, we can feel it when we measure pulse, but also we can determine this by blood pressure. Recall that when we measure blood pressure, we determine the hydrostatic pressure that acts on blood vessel wall. And hydrostatic pressure is equal to weight of fluid which is applied to a particular ear. And weight of fluid is equal to fluid density times fluid volume times gravity constant. With all due respect, what the fuck are you talking about? The same is true for the left arm. So blood pressure that we measure on left arm will also be hydrostatic pressure that acts on blood vessel wall. In addition to this, we have to understand that blood flow through the artery is directly proportional to the pressure difference, which is not important here, and inversely proportional to the resistance of the vessel, and resistance is inversely proportional to the force power of radius. In Takayasu arteritis, inflammation within the blood vessel wall causes significant narrowing of the blood vessel. With decrease in radius, resistance increase, and with increase in resistance, blood flow decrease. With decrease in blood flow, the volume of blood that incomes to the extremities decrease. And as we see from formula, hydrostatic pressure is directly proportional to fluid volume. So, if volume of blood that incomes to extremities decrease, hydrostatic pressure decrease, and thereby blood pressure decrease. So, in this case, Takayasu arteritis 
because decreasing systolic blood pressure in right arm. And in addition to this, decreasing blood income to right arm cause weakening of pulse. But what about left arm? The income of blood to left arm remains the same, which means that the volume of blood which incomes to the left arm remains the same. And same volume gives same blood pressure. So blood pressure on left arm remains normal. So if previously blood pressure on both arms was equal, now with affected right subclavian artery, blood pressure on right arm becomes lower. But blood pressure on left arm remains the same. We call this symptom systolic blood pressure difference in arms. Usually the blood pressure difference is more than 20. In addition to this, normal blood income to left arm gives normal pulse. So the pulse on left arm remains normal, but the pulse on right arm becomes significantly weaker. Things have not been going well, as you know. Let's suppose that in addition to the right subclavian artery, also right common carotid artery becomes affected. What the fuck is this? Whose ass didn't I kiss? Huh? Let's be honest. Okay. Um, I mean, let listen. us be fucking honest. This is a crucifixion. First of all, this will cause decrease in blood supply to the brain, which immediately will cause CNS symptoms. Also, we have to understand that local inflammation cause local pain. Also, inflammation cause increase in white blood cells and erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Additionally, the architecture of artery with inflammation will change. From physics, we know that any obstruction to the blood flow will create turbulence. And turbulence creates sound that we call brood. So, in this case, tachyoso arteritis will cause brood in right subclavian artery and right common carotid artery. Why it's so important for us? Because, as we see, classification criteria have arm or leg laudation, reduced pulse in upper extremities, systolic blood pressure difference, vascular brood, and carotid artery abnormality. So, it's all the signature clinical symptoms of tachyoso arteritis. If carotid or vertebral arteries becomes affected, this will cause decrease in blood income to CNS and nervous tissue, which typically manifest as TIA or vision loss. If renal artery becomes affected, this causes decrease in blood income to kidneys, which results in kidney injury. And kidney injury manifests as increase in blood creatinine and increase in blood urea or blood urea nitrogen level. Also, renal artery stenosis can cause severe hypertension. If mesenteric arteries become affected, this can cause ischemia in mesenteric tissue. And mesenteric ischemia typically manifests as severe abdominal pain provoked by eating. Good. Great. As we see in classification criteria, we have abdominal aorta involvement with renal or mesenteric involvement. Also, because it's systemic autoimmune disease, the chiasso arteritis affects numerous blood vessels at once. So, systemic involvement is also the signature feature. So, to summarize, the chiasso arteritis called pulseless disease because the signature feature of this disorder is weak pulse in upper extremities. In addition to this, the chiasso arteritis causes fever, night sweats, arthritis, myalgias, Sometimes it can cause skin nodules and visual disturbances. Because the chaos arteritis causes severe inflammation, in blood analysis we can determine increase in white blood cells and DSR. And treatment is mostly glucocorticosteroids. As we see from the most recent guideline, the treatment includes combination of glucocorticosteroids with immunosuppressive agents as methotrexide, azotioprine, and TNF inhibitors. 
What did we learn, Palmer? I don't know, sir. I don't fucking know either. And? And, no and nothing. That's it.